So I want to talk today about what Social Europe has, has done for me. And by me, I mean me as an employee and what effect any Brexit might have on that. So when I'm thinking about what Social Europe has done for employees, I think we can say there are some good things, there are some complicated things and there are some underwhelming things. And I'm going to look at it in those uh, three ways. Let's start with the good. Now, it's obviously good from an employee's perspective, but there are a number of directives in the employment field and employment as quite narrowly defined. Some people talk about it in terms of patchwork quilt. Patchwork quilt, quite a large one, but with some holes. They're not, it's not a comprehensive coverage. But there are directives in about six areas of employment law. And I will briefly just have a look at what they are. The first ones are um, when things go wrong with a business. So there are directives about information consultation when a business goes under. There are, secondly, really important directives in the field of equality, some which you will have heard of. So, for example, directives on equal pay, equal treatment, and very importantly for the United Kingdom, directives on uh, race equality and also what's called the horizontal directive on discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation and age and disability. Related to those is a third area, which are directives concerning what we might term family friendly policies in the broadest sense. So directives on parental leave and pregnant workers and related as well are the fourth group, which are directives on atypical work, part time work, fixed term work and more controversially in the UK agency work. Fifthly, there are directives on health and safety. And these are health and safety in the narrowly defined sense, but also rather important directives that have been quite important in the UK, in particular, the directive on working time. And this directive, as you know, lays down the maximum 48 hour working week, but has also introduced the requirement of four weeks paid annual leave, which the UK has extended to 5.6 weeks paid annual leave. So um, important um, legislative measures. And then finally, a more broad group of uh, measures concerning information consultation, uh, information consultation in the workplace and also at European level. So there's quite a lot of stuff. There's quite a lot of stuff out there which employees have benefited, benefited from. And that's why the trade unions have broadly been supportive of the European Union project. And generally, they've also been supportive of the European Court of Justice, which generally, not always, but when presented with interesting social policy questions have tend, has tended to find in favour of the employee in some way. So given quite a broad reading of what's meant by sex discrimination, for example, making sure that rights are effective um, on the ground through the operation of mechanisms like direct effect. So from an employee's perspective, the story I've told is actually a rather good news one that the EU has done some good things. But I said it's also complicated too, and the areas where it's complicated um, are twofold. First of all, the coverage. Now, what is EU law trying to do? Is it supplementing? Is it complementing what's done at national level? And here there are issues about competence, i.e. the power. Does the EU actually have the power to legislate in all the areas that trade unions might want? And there's a notable and important exclusion. There's no competence, at least specific competence, in respect of EU legislation on pay and the right to strike and also lockouts. And that's quite an important limitation. The other area which um, poses problems for employment law are the application of the negative treaty provisions on the four freedoms. And this came to a head in the controversial litigation um, Viking and Laval. And Viking is particularly difficult for the United Kingdom because essentially what the court said in that case was that uh, rules on strike action allowing trade unions to call their members out on strike in certain circumstances must be read subject to the four freedoms, in particular the rules on freedom of establishment. And a lot of people say that in that case, the court prioritised the economic freedoms of employers to set up their business in other member states over the interests of trade unions and their ability to call their members out on strike. I've also said that 
EU law has been underwhelming. And the area where it's been most underwhelming is in respect of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Now, that does have a title called the Solidarity Title, which contains social rights. And you might be thinking, well, that surely is a good thing because it makes a charter a rather interesting document because for the first time it puts civil, political, economic and social rights in one and the same document. However, the Solidarity Title may well not contain rights as such, despite the language, but merely principles, and principles can be used much less strategically than rights can. Furthermore, the UK may have an opt-out from the Solidarity title. The UK doesn't have an opt-out from the Charter as a whole, but in rather opaque language, it may be that there is some opt-out provision from the so-called Solidarity title, which is the title which contains the social rights. And even in respect of other member states, where there is no opt-out, and I say I use this with great caution because it's uh, a vexed area, the Court of Justice has not covered itself in glory here and used the solidarity title to deliver effective social rights. So this is what I mean by the EU being somewhat underwhelming. So what I've shown is that there are a lot of directives which do deliver good things for employees. So what effect would Brexit have on that? Well, if it's pure Brexit and nothing else put in its place, no Norway, no Switzerland model, what would it look like? There's nothing to stop the, e the UK from repealing all of the implementing legislation which has given effect to these directives um, in the United Kingdom. I think that would be unlikely. Um, there are various reasons for that. First, some of the directives that I've already mentioned were based on UK law in the first place. So it's unlikely that all of the UK implementing legislation would be repealed. Some of the directives lay down really principles of a civilised society, non-discrimination on the grounds of age, race, disability, sexual orientation. Surely that we have reached the stage in our society where we do not go back on these absolutely fundamental principles. And thirdly, there is one particular directive on transfer of undertakings and the UK had the opportunity of reducing the standards somewhat and we decided that actually what we had done over and above the directive was actually a good thing for both employers and employees and we didn't do it, which tends to suggest that the UK wouldn't envisage a wholesale destruction of the implementing legislation. But it would mean, of course, that UK employees would not benefit from any new measures unless we did some sort of Norway. And so we had some sort of relationship with the EU, which meant that we accepted all of the EU legislation in return for enjoying free movement. And certainly uh, Norway does um, do that. It has to respect all of um, the EU employment rules, but without actually having um, any say in their negotiation in the first place. So what can I say? Brexit, it would make a difference, but perhaps in this field, not such a radical difference as perhaps in others. What's interesting is that I suspect that there is at least a, a consensus that a lot of the things that the EU has done in this area are actually rather good for both employees and even occasionally for employers. Yes, there are problems with specific directives. We know the controversy surrounding the working time directive, but the UK still has its opt-out um, from the 48-hour working week. And interestingly, David Cameron did not highlight employment law as an issue over which there should be negotiation in his Chatham House speech last week. This to suggests that actually EU employment law is a good thing for employees and for the country.